Good morning, everybody. My name is Molly Klein. I'm a master's student at a small university in West Texas called Solos State University. And this morning, I'll be speaking about mescaline concentrations in various tissues of peyote, otherwise known as a fopper Okay, so the fopper is a small globular cactus um, producing flowers apically between the months of March and May. Um, this cactus does not have spines, and instead of spines on its aerials, it produces woolly trichomes, which are about one centimeter long. The range, the geographical range of the Fafa Williamsii is substantially larger in Mexico. However, we do have um, two areas in Texas that do have populations of Fafa Williamsii, um, one in West Texas and one in South Texas. South Texas has four counties that are considered the peyote gardens of Texas. This is where commercial harvesting occurs for these plants. Um, so here's a picture of the, the pieces that I shot. Excuse me. Here's a picture of the fopper lanzii and the different tissues that I examined. So the crown's on top, and you can see the little small circular areoles on the top where the woolly trichomes are produced. The subterranean stem is the part of the stem that's actually been pulled into the ground um, in times of drought. And it also has aerials on it, residual aerials on the top part of the subterranean stem. You can see one um, here on the left side, right by the edge of the subterranean stem. And then, of course, the root of the plant is on the bottom. Um, when they harvest these plants, typically they cut the crown transversely to the ground. Um, sometimes they cut too deeply and um, take part of that subterranean stem. Historically, these plants have been used for thousands of years by the natives of the Chihuahuan Desert, 6,000 plus years at least, um, and the crown has been used for ceremonial purposes, and the subterranean stem and root have historically been used for therapeutic purposes, such as topical wells. Um, here's a picture of some dry peyote buttons. These buttons belong to Juana Parker, Juana Parker was instrumental in spreading the peyote religion throughout the Plains tribes in the late 1800s. Um, so that's when basically everybody adopted this peyote religion. So um, this peyote button in the center is considered a grandfather peyote and would be placed on an altar in front of participants of a peyote ceremony. Okay. So the Native American church lawfully uses this as their sacrament. Um, we have no idea how many members actually belong to the Native American church. Um, and, let's see. Commercial harvesting occurs in the peyote gardens of South Texas, as I said. Um, about 1.5 million buttons to 2 million buttons are taken out of South Texas per year. And um, there's been a lot of unsustainable harvesting practices. Here in this photo, you can see some of the crowns with a substantial amount of subterranean stem still attached to them. Um, these plants have, been, in essence, been killed because all of the functional aerials are probably removed and lateral branching of pups cannot occur at that point. Okay, so mescaline is the predominant psychoactive compound. Um, much study has been done on the crown of the Fafarolians yet, but nobody's ever isolated the subterranean stem and the root tissue. It's all been lumped into this one group called root. Um, and so my research actually isolates the crown, the subterranean stem, and the root, and um, attempts to show where the psychotropic medicine is found, um, and to try to keep the native, uh, keep the peyoteros, the people that actually go out and harvest these things, from chopping too deeply into the subterranean stem, because we've already had, um, we're, we're having a big conservation issue with it. I mean, uh, the, the peyote gardens are dwindling. There was a paper done in the mid '90s about how. Um, these plants are, are disappearing, and so I'm trying to save the plants. So for my project, I cut, I took 13 plants from Star County that were grown in the Sol Ross greenhouse since 2004. I pulled them out in December of 2012, and then I cut them into um, respective portions of crown, subterranean stem, and root tissue. Um, the crown here, you can see some of the aerials with some of the woolly trichomes sticking out and the vascular tissue that connects it to the Subterranean so stem is basically the same kind of thing, other than it doesn't have the chlorophyll in it. And then as the gamium spreads, it becomes root tissue. OK, 
Okay, so these plants were cut transversely into these sections and then um, thinly sliced, laid on a screen to dry for about a week. And then I took about one, let's see, one gram of each uh, sample. So I had, all in all, I had um, 39 samples. Pulverized them with mortar and pestle and then put them in methanol to extract for about a week swirling the beakers every day with parafilm on top so that it can extract all the alkaloids. Then this was filtered with magnified filter paper placed under a fume hood to dry. Once this had evaporated, um, me. I added 50 milliliters of methylene chloride to dissolve the residue on the bottom of the beaker. Then I added that into a separatory funnel with water protonated to a pH of three in order to um, protonate the amine group on the mescaline, which basically pulls the mescaline into the water, and all the non-phenolic alkaloids actually into the water, and allows the, ph the phenolic alkaloids to dissolve in the methylene chloride, which is on the bottom, the green part. The water is on the top. So then I drained the water into the beakers. I mean, I drank the methylene chloride off and saved that for future research on the phenolic alkaloids. Then I collected the water raised the pH to 12, adding sodium hydroxide, and um, this, in, in effect, deprotonated the non-phenolic alkaloids and allowed them to dissolve in the additional methylene chloride that I added back to the separatory funnel. Sh shaken well, allowed to separate overnight, and after this, um, the methylene chloride on the bottom now contains non-phenolic alkaloids, including mescaline. So once this was drained off, I was, I was, I allowed that to, to dry under a fume hood under, overnight, and um, then I produced my original extract by adding 10 milliliters of methanol, uh, HPLC grade methanol, and um, for all of the different extracts, all 39 of them, and then I realized after preliminary data came in that um, my crop tissue had to be diluted two more times in order to hit the linear interval of my standard curve of mescaline. And then I actually had to add mescaline to all the subterranean stem and root samples in order to reach the standard curve, the linear interval of my standard curve of mescaline. So here's the standard curve of mescaline that I used. Um, basically, uh, I make this by injecting uh, four different vo uh, volumes of a known concentration of mescaline, and then basically plotted peak height against mescaline concentration, the known concentration in each volume. And then um, when I sent my samples through the HPLC instrument, I would know, I could do calculations and know exactly how much mescaline is in each sample. And then of course I had to subtract the mescaline that I added from the subterranean stem in the root in order to find out exactly how much mescaline was in the plants. Okay, so crown tissue is on the top here. In the crown tissue we had between 1.8 and 5.5% mescaline, which is um, typical values have been between 2% and 4% mescaline, you know, however, it does get lower and it does get higher um, in other people's research. Okay, so terrain and stem, it, it goes down by a factor of 10. Um, so we've got between um, 1.7 and 0.38% um, mescaline. And then um, into the root, we have very little, just trace amounts of mescaline between 0.015% and 0.077% mescaline. Okay, so a logarithmic translation of the data. Um, basically, all the p values are less than 0 0.0001, which shows that, my, that the crown tissue, the subterranean stem, and the root tissue. Um, the mescaline concentrations are highly significantly different from one another, and um, this is wonderful for the data, and it, it means a lot for conservation of the species. Okay, so the standard deviation of the mean, all the standard deviations of the mean were so very small, we are also talking about every p-value was less than 0 0.0001. Okay, so what this means for people, basically, um, Commercial harvesting will not be able to continue for the Native American church if they don't do something about um, sustainable harvesting practices. Right now, in essence, the, the plants are dwindling, they're harvesting too, too frequently, um, and they're harvesting improperly, sometimes even pulling the entire plant out, and using these as um, 
for therapeutic purposes like topical rubs and such. But my data is, has basically shown that there's not very much mescaline in the subterranean stem and root. Now this is slightly different from um, the historic populations in the Chihuahua Desert that have been used for therapeutic purposes before. Um, my research is showing, well, actually Dr. Terry's research showed that there is a mescaline uh, concentration gradient as you move west into the desert and have less water. Um, so the mescaline concentration goes up. And these plants are the plants that have historically been researched. And so there's a difference in the commercial population in South Texas than in these populations in West Texas. Also, um, what Dr. Terry has also found is that he's only found two alleles in the entire, in, in, in the state of Texas. Um, all the plants in West Texas are homologous for one allele, all the plants that have been sampled at least. And all the plants in South Texas that have been sampled are homologous for a different allele. So genetically speaking, they're different. And um, we believe they're different. The mescaline concentration follows those lines as well. And so the next step in this would be to check the plants in the Chihuahua Desert and make sure that, um, that they have more mescaline in the subterranean stem of the root, because that's the big question. Historically, those people have been using this um, differently, you know, they've been using topical rubs and things like that, and that might make sense for them because it might actually have a substantial amount of alkaloids. However, the plants in South Texas do not. I'd like to thank everyone for their help on this, especially Dr. Martin Terry. sometimes they call it, it's because it's um, drought stressed or winter stressed and basically it'll lose its chlorophyll and start producing the beta cyanins instead of um, the chlorophyll. And they're actually highly sought after um, because they have a lot more alkaloids in them. Yes ma'am? How in practice would you think that this could, that your research could be used to make change in the views or habits or um, I would hope so in the end. I just don't know exactly how to implement that. Um, it's really hard to get a group of indigenous people that are non-trusting to everyone. And have, or, there's a lot of misinformation um, in the church, and it's kind of uh, fractioned. I mean, there's not, there's not a whole cohesive group that's actually the Native American church. It's different factions. You know, It's different groups that don't even know each other. So it, it, it's hard to get that information out, and um, I'm looking for a way to do that. It's just difficult. Um, and they're not trusting of outsiders and everything, so you kind of have to you know, gain their trust before they'll believe anything, so. Yes, sir? I may have missed this, but uh, did you compare the clone crowns with the original crown to see if, what difference is there maybe there? I have not yet. Um, basically, I wanted to do my project with the plants in South Texas to show that they're really, you know, to try to, to try to stop the, the over-harvesting of them by cutting the subterranean stem. Now, that's the next step. I mean, it would be really interesting to do that and find out exactly what is going on. Um, you know, and also these plants were grown in the greenhouse for several years, too. So, you know, there's, that, that's a big question mark as well. Yes? Oh, what what ways have you found to harvest from the crown sustainably so that, uh, I mean, you take a little bit of the top or half of the top? Or? You can cut all of the green part, no problem. And, and that's where all the mescaline is anyway. We believe it's produced in the chlorophyll. However, <laughs> research hasn't been done on that either, but it just seems that it, that's what's going on. Uh -huh. um, so you can cut the whole crown without damaging the plant. It, it usually will reproduce pups. I mean, only 10% mortality rate when they have to go and cut the crown off. And how long can you do that for? Um, well, you shouldn't. They're harvesting every two years right now, which is just ridiculous. It should be, you know, more like every eight or ten years. 
Um, and, and Dr. Terry is doing a long-term study on that right now. He's in year five, and every two years he goes out and samples. So um, give it another five years. Yes, ma'am. Did you look at um, total alkaloid content? Because isn't it um, more similar to just alkaloids? I did not look at total alkaloid content, but I did keep the phenolic alkaloids so that I could go back and look at them as well. Um, I still have all of my samples and everything if I do want to do more research on that in the end. Um, Yes, sir. Okay. So how do we get the message out? Again, the back to the theme. I mean, to the Native American community. Well, that's part of the reason I'm here. I mean, I'm, I'm totally open for suggestions. I mean, that's that's the big question. Um, right. Um, it seemed to me that you know, if they were aware of this because it is a sacrament. Mm -hmm. Uh, then they don't go out and harvest it themselves. Right. They have little guys that go out and harvest for them, and there's kind of a, a gap between between that, and they don't really, they've been told that the plant grows back from the root, because that's what it seems like when everything's under the ground, you just kind of think, oh, well, if you cut the top off, it comes back from the root. So if I leave any part of the root in there, it's going to come back. And so there's just a bunch of misinformation going, and it's really hard to change people's minds when their family's been telling them that it's this way the whole time. You know, just even, even the fact that it was brought in, you know, most of the tribes got it in the late 1800s. Um, they believe that they've had this forever. I mean, and, and they'll tell you, they, you know, that their family has told them they've been using this cactus forever. When in, in effect, it was other cacti that they were using. They were always using sacred cacti. However, they weren't using peyote. Very few of them were at least. Yes, sir? What sort of forms of communication of dialogue does the Native American church use internally for other things? Because the obvious way would be to sort of um, use something which the church already uses, be it uh, a poster display, be it a, a website, be it um, some sort of a meeting of the group. So, you know, have you explored what communication stru structures already exist? My professor speaks with their lawyers. I mean, it's not, they're factions. It's not this big, cohesive group. Yeah. It's just little, I mean, they don't even know each other. I mean, even if they're right down the road, it's not, it's not a big group like what you would think of as the Native American church. We want to think of it like that, but it's just not true. Well, I wouldn't, I'm aware that it's a very fraction, um, mm -hmm. yeah, um, segment of society. But what I mean is you have these little communities. And the idea is, can you get into some of them and try to engage with them? I'm not talking about the whole um, lot of all the churches. If you want to talk about how can you get the message across at a community level, what are the ways of communication most preferred there? What I've been, I, I know several people who were involved. I have not, you know, gone to any of the meetings or done anything like that at present. Um, it's just really hard to to um, get people to trust you like that, especially when you're researching um, with the plant. I mean, they're just not very trusting on this whole thing. I would, I'm very interested in trying to meet some of them and everything. It's just, that's, a, that's like the next step. I've just finished the research. I'm, I'm finishing my thesis right now. And hopefully one day I can get involved with that. John? There's the alligator juniper that's in this uh, similar habitat. And historically, the Native Americans have harvested branches, but not harvested the whole tree. You could use that as a, as a metaphor for a sustainable harvest technique. Mm -hmm. Well, they think they're sustainably harvesting it. That's, that's one of the issues, is they think it grows back from the root. So they think if you just leave some of the plant in there, that it will come back. And it's just misconceptions and misinformation that's been passed down. And really, who are you going to believe, your family or just somebody that comes in off the street? Because you know, you really have to get that rapport and, and get them to trust you before they're really going to listen to what you have to say. I'm up for any suggestions on that, though. <laughs> Anyone else? Thank you very much.